I mean, I don't think anybody knows when they're going to die, but I certainly felt like I was going to that day. I mean, it was so vivid and intense in my awareness. Hello, and welcome to the Trip Sitting Podcast, where we explore what it means to be human. This week's guest is Sarah Howat, and she is an amazing woman who has facilitated probably hundreds of ceremonies <clears throat> using different types of plant medicines for people at this point, has done a lot of work herself, and is somebody who really just embodies love and embodies change on this path to trying to help people and just talk so openly about her own personal experiences. And it's something that I really love and respect about her. She's someone with so many incredible experiences doing so many different things. And I'm so glad that we got the chance to sit down actually for a second time now to record this podcast. And it really turned out amazing. And I think that she had a lot of wisdom to share and there's a lot that uh, everybody is gonna be able to learn from. And before we dive in, if you can like, if you can subscribe, and if you could also rate this podcast on whatever podcast streaming platform you're listening to this on, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. And then also make sure that you're following Trip Sitting at tripsitting.blog on Instagram and TikTok, and then subscribe to my newsletter, Trippy Monday, in order to just get three short things that caught my attention from the past week that I learned from, or just that I thought were interesting uh, in your inbox every Monday, it's really, really short. And you could go to my website, tripsitting.blog to subscribe to that. Now, without further ado, here is Sarah. Your word of the year is essence this year, correct? Mm -hmm. What made you pick that word? That's a great question. Usually I have some sort of, um, you know, great story lead up to why I did something. I think this felt like, you know, I, I turned 38 this year, which is like not a particularly, you know, big <laughs> year, right? It's usually the decade years. Um, but for some reason, just like in my own process of personal development, spiritual development and growth, I have started to recognize how little I actually still know myself. And I started to think about how so often we adopt the personalities of past partners or the stories of our parents or the burdens of our bosses or whatever it is that we're adopting. And we don't even know that we are doing that. And in part, that's how we're, that's how we're built, right? Even as children, you see the way that children mimic and learn from what the adults in the room are doing. So we're built that way. And I started to ask myself the question, who am I? Like without all of these other things that I've adopted from other people or my trauma or my whatever beliefs or stories I have about myself, who really am I? And um, it's been a really interesting year. I think I like the word essence because um, there is an essence to everything. Like, you know, one of the, one of the things that a lot of coaches will ask is what did you like to do as a child, you know, inner child work. But I think the piece that's often forgotten or left out is if you loved to do puzzles as a child, it doesn't mean that you should just do puzzles as an adult and that that's going to somehow fulfill that like longing. It's really about getting to the essence of what you loved about puzzles. And so um, for me, the word essence is like a fragrance, you know, it's like an energy and it's the kind of the core truth of something and without all the fluff and the bullshit. And so I really wanted to get to know who I am apart from all the fluff and the bullshit <laughs> um, and just rediscover, you know, like what hap what would happen if I actually did the thing that scared me? What would happen if I told that person how I felt about them? What would happen if I dyed my hair back to my natural color and gave up this identity of like the dark punk rock goth girl, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> what, what, how would that feel? Do I like that? And if not, I can always go back. So why not? I love that. And uh, I, I also want to point out right now that we we recorded a whole other podcast probably like two to three months ago, uh, like 
it, actually we, we recorded it over two days too because we had so much that we then did it again the next day and both wore the same shirts and everything um and then like a week after that uh something pretty big changed in your life and then we decided to put that on pause and said we were going to record again so do you want to talk about what happened and how you've how you've changed since then and maybe been trying to really find that essence since we recorded that first one yeah that's such a great question i um apologies for the <laughs> ringing in the background <laughs> Um, I, so I was working for a company called psychedelic passage. You've actually had one of the owners, um, one of the founders on your podcast and, um, I'm no longer working with them as of about May 1st. And so, um, and it, all, all as well, you know, um, we've, we've remained friends and, um, it just wasn't a good fit anymore. And a couple years ago in an ayahuasca ceremony, I was given, a vision of a business that I was to start and run. And I was given a name and that name was love to the people. And in the vision, I actually saw, did I describe this last time? I don't think no. I did. The way that it was shown to me is I saw two sides of an aisle, like Democrat and Republican, you know, something like that, but kind of like all the facets and variations of that. Um, I saw two different sides fighting with one another and they were like, I mean, it was like the ugliest parts of humanity. They were like spitting on each other and hurling insults and throwing bombs and just, it was utter chaos. And I saw this line of women. I saw like an infinite line of women all standing together, like shoulder to shoulder facing these two sides, these two opposing sides and dividing them from one another, like keeping them from one another. And the women were just standing with their hearts open and they were just crying, but they weren't attacking back or doing anything in response. And the people then that were fighting with one another and trying to get to one another, like a bunch of rabid dogs actually started attacking the women and hurling insults at the women and beating the women. And the women still did not fight back. They just stood there with their hearts open, just weeping for this side of humanity. And it was through their love that the spell of that separation was broken and the people suddenly woke up from the spell that they were under. Um, it was a really beautiful vision. And I saw myself running this company as an old woman and I still have no idea what this, I started this company last year finally, and I still have no idea what it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was funny, you know, right before Psychedelic Passage and I parted ways, I told God or the universe, I said, I feel like I've been running a, or I've been training for a marathon and I'm ready to run it now. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then that happened and it was like, okay, time to run the marathon. Let's figure this out, you know? And in terms of how I've changed, I mean, one of the biggest things that, um, one of the biggest things I've ever done actually took place about two weeks ago on my birthday. I had this vision of throwing a huge birthday party for myself this year as a part of this exploration of who am I? Because I never had any friends growing up and I never got invited to birthday parties and I never had a big birthday party. And in fact, I hated my birthday party and would always find a reason to, um, to prove to myself that I was unloved because of all this loneliness that I experienced as a child. And so that would often, you know, in my past, that would look like me getting drunk, starting a fight with my partner and then spending the rest of my birthday alone. Right. Mm -hmm. So I could prove to myself, yeah, it's, it's like that. It's like that narrative you have in your head of, well, I was alone there. So now like, I'm just going to do that. So even in times when like, you're actually not alone, you're going to find a way to make it. So I am because exactly. you want to, you want that narrative to be right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Let's prove the story to be true. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so earlier this year, I decided I was going to throw a really big birthday party for myself and invite my favorite DJ to perform, which is Saint Sinner. Uh, along with a good friend of mine, Wyatt, uh, who goes by just like you imagined. And uh, I was going to invite everybody and it was going to be totally free, my gift. And then when I was no longer working with Psychedelic Passage, I thought, well, crap, now I don't know that I can <laughs> make this happen. <laughs> but I told a girlfriend about it and she said, great, I'll pay for St. Sinner. You get the rest. Like, let's do it. And so we put on this huge event. There were probably 100, 150 people that showed up. Uh, many of whom I did not know from the community. 
And it was one of the best nights of my whole life. It was so magical. And um, just creating that experience and actually seeing it through despite all the doubt and the fear and the, you know, oh my God, nobody's signing up. What if I do this whole thing for 20 people? Like how embarrassing would that be? Mm -hmm. uh, I still, we still went forward with it and it was, it was, yeah, it was the best night of my life. It was incredible. That's awesome. How did that, how did that feel seeing that all the way through and then really like, you know, essentially proving that narrative incorrect? Yeah. I mean, honestly, during the event, I think my nervous system was a bit overwhelmed, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, you know, as a kid who didn't really have a lot of friends and um, even as an adult, you know, like I know a lot of people, I, could, I call myself a pollinator. I'm like a little bumblebee that just kind of like flutters around to different friend groups, but I'm not really like tight with anybody. Mm -hmm. And I have like a very small group of close knit friends, you know, maybe less, fewer than five really. Mm -hmm. And um, so to have, you know, a hundred plus people singing me happy birthday and all the, all the eyes and attention on me, my nervous system was just like, Ugh! <laughs> I'm freaking out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to see it through was really quite a process because, you know, um, actually I had a mushroom ceremony back in December. Um, I had a child that I placed for adoption when I was 16 and um, I have an open adoption. He knows who I am. He's 21 now. But I was shown in a mushroom ceremony how that process of adoption and what happened with his with my son's father and just the abandonment wound and all of that, the betrayal, really put this like, I had a wound in like my womb where I was afraid to create anything of value because I was afraid it was just going to be taken away from me, essentially. And um, when I realized that, it was huge because... I couldn't figure out why I wouldn't see things through to completion. You know, I would just kind of abandon, abandon ship when things would get hard. And so to see this through, even in the moments where I doubted everything, um, was really special. It felt like a, it felt like a big completion moment in my life. Yeah. Damn. I can't imagine like how hard that must've been at 16 year old at, at 16 to, to go through that process. Like truly, it's just it's just something that's beyond me. And what I can't imagine is how difficult it is to overcome that mm -hmm. <laughs> and how that that is sort of a lifelong thing that you have to deal with. So, and you know, at 16, I, I would imagine your first thought was probably, well, I'm just going to try to forget about this <laughs> uh, yeah. and just go through life and just, you know, not really fully embrace that. So like when did... Was, was that mushroom ceremony really the first time that that came back up? Or has that been a lifelong thing that kind of comes and goes? It's really interesting. Um, the story of the adoption um, was really interesting because for the first eight, literal eight months that I was pregnant, I was going to keep him. And right around, I don't know, must have been early eight months. My mom, we, you know, I was really struggling and my, mo my mother said, do you love him? And I said, of course I love him. That's, that's why I want to keep him. You know, mm -hmm. she said, well, if you truly love something, you have to be willing to do what's best for that thing. Even if you don't like it, like sac sacrificial love, you know, yeah. if you love something, let it go. Yes, exactly. And so I, really took that to heart. And I remember I went downstairs and I took a shower and I was just sitting on the floor of my shower and I was weeping. And I said, all right, God, if you want me to do this, like if I'm meant to place him for adoption, I will do it. But my, the deal is I never want to regret it in my whole life. Like, because that's about the worst thing I can think of is to regret a decision like that. And I decided to meet with the pregnancy counselor she gave me like eight profile books to look through and I picked my top three, but I had one that was my favorite. And without telling anyone, I showed probably 60 people through my school, my family, my church, my friends, uh, parents, you know, of course, all of that. And every single person picked the same family that I picked without mm -hmm. me telling them that that was, they were my favorite. I didn't have a single person pick another, a different family. And that was my confirmation. And so I chose to go with them and I've never regretted it in my whole life. Wow. Um, and so, and they've been wonderful. You know, I'm very close with them and uh, met their whole family. They've met all of my family. 
Um, but when it comes to that deep healing that sometimes resides within and we don't even know, we can think everything's fine, but then we have that one mushroom experience. It's like, <laughs> oh no, it's not okay. <laughs> you know? Sorry. Damn it. I thought that was, I was in the clear with that one. Um, I, that was a surprise to me, but to be honest, it wasn't about the decision itself. It was more about the betrayal of the father and how that rejection, betrayal, abandonment all affected that creation. Because it was almost like I gave life to this human and that still wasn't good enough for me to be loved by that person. Mm -hmm. And I don't get me wrong. I'm so glad that relationship is long done. Um, and that wound is still there from that time in my life, you know? So yeah. It's interesting how these things can pop up and we we think we're good and we're mm, mm, mm. <laughs> we just we just haven't really fully you know felt all of the emotions and felt all of the things we need to feel back then like yeah. we can kind of acknowledge it and look at it but you know letting it in and i guess kind of integrating it into our being like that's the part that i think we struggle with unless you're really consciously going for it mm-hmm I had an ayahuasca ceremony once where I fell into a, a what felt like a literal infinite pit of self-loathing and hate, self-hatred. And that was a huge realization for me. Um, I had no idea that that resided within me. And it was it literally felt like I fell into just this black nothingness of self-hatred. It was like, oh, that's, that's in there. Okay, <laughs> time to yeah. deal with that. <laughs> yeah, that was, I mean... I, I don't think mine was so much as like self-hatred, but mine was just so much of like my, my second ayahuasca ceremony. I've still only sat with ayahuasca three times. Um, but during the second ceremony, it was just all of these emotions of just any time in my life that I've ever felt shame or guilt. And basically that then turning into the I'm unloved narrative. Mm -hmm. But just any time that's come up, I just immediately just shoved that down. And I'm like, whatever, like, I don't care. I'm just going to, live my life regardless but like i do believe like i did believe that i am unloved at that point like i let that in and then was like whatever i'm just gonna live life anyways so i i just had no idea how much that was truly affecting my subconscious and just all of my decisions up until that point mm -hmm. i wanted to ask you as well so what are some times in your life whether they're recently or or you know growing up that you can remember where you really did feel yourself at your essence of like who you actually are? Mm, that's a great question. You know, um, having done all that one on one facilitation work with psychedelic passage, I would say in most ceremonies, I feel that. Um, and the reason I say that is because I feel peaceful and I feel loving and I, I take on, I think this kind of like motherly energy, but like very healthy motherly energy. I'm not like hovering over them, like anything, what do you want? Wait, you know, not like that, but just a very like stable presence, very stable, loving, nurturing presence. Um, and, and I'm able to sit and really listen to spirit in those spaces. And that feels like a true, very true part of my essence, the, you know, the listener, um, Um, I, <laughs> I had a, for a moment, I thought, am I talking about psychedelics too much? And then I thought, of course, you're not talking about psychedelics too much. Um, it's called trip sitting. <laughs> you are on the trip sitters podcast after all. I've got a mushroom uh, on my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got my uh, Yawanawa earring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a, I had a bufo ceremony recently where the facilitator, I've worked with her before. She usually gives me it's usually a threshold dose, um, like around 80 to a hundred milligrams or is it micrograms or milligrams? I can't remember, but anyways, I think it's milligrams, mil milligrams. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and she just gave me 22 and mm. uh, it was just going to be a meditation dose. That's all I wanted. And I went into a full blown threshold dose experience, but I was, I was like, it, it was interesting. Cause I think I had had enough experience with that medicine, um, that, I was really able to surrender fully, even at such a low dose. And when I do, I don't know if you've ever done that, if you've ever done Buvo, but I'm not, there's usually two types of people. There's usually thrashers 
and they look and sound like they're having an exorcism, which I am that type. And then there's people who just like lay in perfect stillness and don't move a single muscle. Got it. So I'm a thrasher <laughs> and I went into that and, uh, it was so interesting because I knew that I was a thrasher and typically when I do Bufo, the facilitator ends up purging and I've, I've, um, mm. facilitate, I've helped facilitate these ceremonies before. So I understand I've experienced that myself holding space. Um, but I always had some shame around that. Like, why is it, what, what is it about me? Is it all this trauma that's being released or all this darkness or like, what is it? And in this particular ceremony, I looked down and I could see my solar plexus and it was as bright as the sun. I mean, it was just like, like shooting out everywhere and glowing. And I went and I was like, I was like bucking, like I was like a bucking, like a bucking Bronco. I was growling. Like it was this very like animal body type experience. Um, and I realized in that moment, like the reason why facilitators purge is because I'm letting all this energy, like all this energy is coming out basically, but that it's not dark. It's actually very bright, a very bright light. And I think that was, that was really one of the things that was so, and that was this year with my word of the year being essence. I think that that was one of the moments that I felt like I truly saw who I am, um, without shame, you know, yeah. both spirit and animal in one. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That was really special, a really special moment. So since you've parted ways with psychedelic passage, where have you been you know, focusing your energy, because I know that that obviously took up a lot of your energy. And, you know, that was something that, yeah, you know, I guess was still relatively new, even. Um, yeah. So how is how have you been able to shift from that and figure out where to go? That's I'm kind of in that process right now. Um, with love to the people, because I don't know what love to the people is meant to be. I don't know what it wants to be. Um, I kind of feel the same way about trip sitting, by the way, like this was something for me that I started without a real idea of what I wanted it to be at all. Um, like, you know, I knew I wanted to talk about psychedelics and, you know, that was kind of about it. It was really just the platform for me to be able to do that with people. But I think that, I think it's really cool. And there's something to be said for starting something without having that full fledged, like, here's my business outline and what I'm mm -hmm. going to do with it of like letting it be like a living, breathing organism that you get to watch change and evolve over time. Like it's not supposed to be this set thing. It's mm -hmm. supposed to change and you're supposed to let it evolve and you're supposed to have like a relationship with it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate all that you just shared about that. I, I do feel like I'm building a relationship with it. And um, I had a pretty profound realization last weekend. Um, I actually hosted like a small women's retreat with, um, with, with psilocybin. And I realized that I love to create in the moment from the heart because it, to me, that's the most beautiful type of creation because it's never repeatable. And there's something really special about um, not planning for something and just really trusting yourself and those around you to create something in the moment that is um, beyond what you could have even planned for, right? It's like truly creating from the heart space rather than the mind and just letting like Jesus take the wheel, like mm -hmm. let's go for it. And uh, I really struggle with the planning element of, of creation because I don't wanna live there. I wanna live in that more spur of the moment beauty centric, um, place, but, um, such a difficult terms... balance though. Like it's, <laughs> it it's, really... it's been, it's definitely been the hardest thing for me to balance between, you know, how much I want to create versus how much I want to simply just rest and how much I need to like plan. And, you know, I want to put this content out, but like, I don't want it to just be like cheap content for the sake of content. It, you know, it's, it's, I, I still haven't like there's I, I can't describe the balance because I still don't know. And I think it mm -hmm. still just changes constantly over time, depending on how I'm feeling on any particular time that I'm trying to think about it. So it's 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 a really interesting process. And for people that maybe haven't tried starting, you know, not even just their own business, but like really consider themselves a creator of something. Um, one, we are all creators. So I want to make that 
a point that everybody knows, even if you don't think you are, you are a creator. We're creating something every single day with, you know, our lives and how it unfolds. So I think we all need to really think of ourselves as that and then have that relationship with it and figure out, you know, why do we like doing what we do? And if you don't like doing what we do, figure out what you do like doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, uh, it is certainly a process and, um, I'm so efficiency driven. It's so funny. I like love to know where I'm going so I can just figure out the fastest way to get there. I'm a manifesting generator, if that means anything to you. So it doesn't, um, what does that mean? It's a type of human design, but essentially I, if you can tell me where we're going, I will figure out the most efficient and way to get there. Um, and I like that. It, it's just part of what lights me up. Um, but the creation process doesn't work like that necessarily. Like, if this beautiful painting behind me, like this artist didn't know that it was going to look like this before he started, you know, I, I mean, I assume not, I'm not yeah. in his mind, but, um, so I'm really trying to get comfortable with creating more in the moment. And I'll tell you that I'm going over to the UK in a few weeks for medicine festival. Um, uh, have you heard of medicine festival? No, it's a really special, a friend of mine went last year. She said it was incredible. It's more of like an indigenous ceremonial focused music festival. That's awesome. Um, with a lot of indigenous elders that come in and teach workshops from their own lineages. And I was accepted to do a grief and death ritual over there. And so I'm hosting that. Uh, it's called a prayer for the end of the world. And it's essentially a grieving ritual for the passing of the old earth um, and transitioning to the new earth. You know, it, it was often in ancient cultures, they would bring in a griever to grieve so that the, the soul that was passing on could transition most more easily to the afterlife. And so we're going to do that in a group setting as a ritual for the entire planet. Um, yeah. What is this new earth that we're moving into? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't realize that there was an old earth to grieve for and that we needed to move into the new earth. Well, I will tell you that, um, you know, Charles Eisenstein talks about how we are in the space between right now, which is essentially all these old structures and, uh, ways of being and working in the world are, are crumbling and shifting and changing, changing financial structures, political structures, economic structures um social structures it's all shifting and changing even this idea that you know we have to suffer to learn anything i think is part of the old earth or the concept that you have to work a nine to five job to make any sort of money right yeah it's like an old concept and so i don't know what the new earth looks like but i do know that we are in a transition from something that hasn't been working for a long time and yeah. uh but there is also grieving there because there is a consequence for those things shifting job loss and, um, you know, all kinds of things. I right? mean, there's, there's, there's chaos that's going to ensue from the shift Yeah, <laughs> no, 100%. working with plant medicine has just taught me to sort of be the observer of the chaos without identifying with it. And that just like being able to sit in the chaos and just be fine with it and, and trust that eventually this is going to settle and it's going to make sense. But you know, if, if you don't have those tools in place, it's, it's really hard to sit through the chaos and just let it happen mm -hmm. without thinking I need to do something about this because that's when it's just yeah. going to create more chaos is if in the chaos, everybody's then trying to do something to fix the chaos. Like the chaos mm -hmm. is going to fix itself. The universe has a way of settling itself. Like it's already in perfect balance. Mm -hmm. So us as humans, I think it's our job to just let it do its thing. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why, I mean, you asked me a moment ago about um, what's new or what have I been working on? I've been contemplating, like, what is it I'm here to teach? What is it that I'm here to, to help, to provide as my medicine to the world, right? And I do feel that grief work is a big part of that because there are so many, I call grief the, uh, the misunderstood child of the emotional family. It's like, the emotion that nobody really wants in the room because it makes everybody else really uncomfortable. And the, what I've learned about grief over the past few years is that grief in its purest form is the most innocent emotion. And 
it's very tender, you know, and, and sweet. And it's also like a backdoor to joy yeah. and um, learning how to grieve uh, coming back to this idea of the space between, but in a different way, I talk about how on the farthest reaches of any spectrum, eventually the two far extremes circle back together and they come together and joy and grief are like that. They, they come out and they circle back together and they touch or nearly touch in the center. And in that space between where they nearly touch is called ecstasy. It's what Richard Rudd, who wrote the Gene Keys, um, he calls that place ecstasy. Hold, being able to hold extreme joy and extreme sorrow at the same time. And I think that our world, there are so many people, even some of the most spiritually advanced people that I know aren't really in touch with their grief or don't understand why they need to be yeah, um, or how it benefits anyone. And I think as these structures start to crumble and the world shifts, and I, I think we're already seeing the beginning stages of this, but there will be a lot of grief. Yeah. And there will be a lot of people who don't know how to shepherd and steward that grief in a, in a beneficial way, in a healing way. So I do very much feel that grief work and death work is a part of the path for love to the people, but not, not only that play too, because you need both. <laughs> yeah, you always need play, but it's interesting actually hearing you talk about grief because that reminds me of like, after, after my experience with ayahuasca and when I came back to real life and was trying to integrate all of that, which was just a lot. But I specifically remember being in touch with grief, specifically in the case of, you know, obviously, I realized that I had this whole unloved narrative going on. And that now I'm realizing, like, I need to be open to love, like love is the reason why we're here. For, for some reason, we all have this experience, and it travels dimensions and all of that. So like, clearly love something of importance here. But I remember specifically like grieving for the inner child that thinks that he's unloved. And it was just a lot of grief for that, knowing that like I'm moving away from that, you know, which is, I think inherently in my mind, like that's a good thing, like I'm moving more into love, but there's still that grief for the old me that didn't quite feel that. And so it was really interesting being able to hold those two because I mean, you are right, like I felt immense joy and immense grief at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, you know, coming back to this idea of momentary beauty that passes in an instant. When I witness something that is beautiful, and particularly if I've smoked a little bit of weed, <laughs> seems to always make it way more intense. Um, I will just weep. I will just yeah. full, full on weep. And it, and it's not that I'm sad or that there's any sort of like trauma or anything under that. It's truly like, I'm so overcome with beauty and with the joy in witnessing the beauty that it's, I, it like breaks my heart. It's, it's like hard really to hard explain to that to people in the moment that are around you. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've <laughs> noticed because I do the exact same thing and I'm like, uh, no, like these are not happy or sad tears. Like this is just like, I, there's so much going on. <laughs> yeah. To I'm just, yeah. Overwhelmed, but it's like in a broke, it's like broken hearted, but open hearted at mm -hmm. the same time, you yeah. know? And I, I love being in that place, but I've definitely made some people uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's this, so something that just keeps coming back to my head for whatever reason is, you know, being able to experience that momentary beauty and just like live in the present is the, uh, this quote from the office that, uh, that Andy Bernard says is that, you know, I wish that you, knew that you were in the good old days, like when you were in the good old days or something like that. I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. And that quote comes to my mind probably at least once a week now, just during some random moment. And I'm like, damn, like, this is it. Like, these are, this is something that I'm going to look back on and be like, that was so cool. So I think it's cool being able to recognize that while you're in those moments that you will one day look back on that moment with that immense joy and that immense grief as well, because, you know, you're grieving that that's no longer there and that's no longer mm -hmm. the case. You're a different person, but also the joy that it happened and that you got to experience these things. Mm -hmm. I heard another one recently that you can add on to your office quote. I love that you just quoted Andy Bernard to me, by the way. Um, <laughs> It, I heard it the other day. It's sorry. I was freaking out. I didn't realize everything was going to be okay. 
Yeah. You know, it's like uh, we get so silly and caught up in these moments. And I've really been trying to make it a practice over the past year and a half or so to just spend more time sitting in nature and just observing and witnessing without a phone, without Instagram, without music, any of that. And just being in the present moment and letting it overcome me Um, and to take it in like a snapshot. You know, I go to I went to a concert the other day and everybody's got their phones out, you know, filming. And they've proven that the more time you spend taking pictures from your phone, the less time you remember the memory Mm -hmm. or the less you remember the memory. And so really just trying to be in the present moment at my birthday party. I think I got two videos and maybe Mm -hmm. one photo. Just because I was like, I have to get, I have, I need something. Yeah, I need something to show that this happened. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) Um, But otherwise, I was just present in the moment. And um, there's something to be said for that, you know, to to be able to take in the beauty of this life, because it really is beautiful, even in the heartbreak and the grief and the fear and the doubt and the worry and all of that. It's still beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is all beautiful. Like we're meant, we're meant to be here to feel it all. We're not meant to judge and think that these are the good memories and these are the bad memories. They're all memories that are there to serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you truly believe that, that to me gives me, I don't know if comfort's the right word, but like it, you know, it, it, it just makes sense to me that that's, that's why we're here. You know, we're, we're just Mm -hmm. supposed to experience it all. Like there, there doesn't Mm -hmm. have to be some grander points to all of this other than it just is and we just exist for the sake of existence Mm -hmm. think of a quote from uh jordan peterson where he's talking about listening to hank williams versus elevator music and he says you know we're not meant to be happy happy is elevator music he said but think about someone like hank williams you know you're experiencing in one song you could experience joy uh, joy and sorrow and love and um, you know, worry and all of it in a single song. He's like, I want that, you know, Mm -hmm. I want happy. Happy is like one note in a symphony of life. Who wants to live in one on one note forever? I actually had this thought the other day that anytime we're caught in a single note experience, whether, and it could be positive or negative, it's time to switch it up, you know, and just get a new perspective. Yeah. Shake it up a little bit. Yeah. Realizing that where those ever-changing beings. And that's something that over the last couple of weeks has really come back to me. I think I've gotten, you know, sort of just settled into what I'm doing and sort of trying to accomplish and where I'm going. And I don't think I was making a lot of space for true change to come into my life anymore. Um, not on purpose. It's, you know, it, these are all subconscious things that happen, but that's really a focus of mine right now of, of coming back to the sense that we are beings of change and I need to let that change in and that I can't control where that change is going to take me. I just have to sit back and surrender and let it happen and trust that it's going to come together and in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And trying on, trying on a new persona too has been something that I've been playing with not only this year with essence, but um, (laughs) last week, when was it? It was like the Sunday after my birthday, I think. I, I took a larger microdose, like more than a microdose. And I dressed up in like, it was really fun, actually. There's, do you know who Brent Pella is? No. He uh, he was actually at that event I saw you at in Denver. Oh, um, sweet. He's a, he's a comedian. And he always does these uh, comedy skits on Instagram about like spiritual people you meet at music festivals and stuff. And so I basically like, channeled what would a character like one of his characters look like and so i got like full-blown like austin spiritual coach vibes going you know mm-hmm. all of it right got my hat on had these like sunglasses that were like these rainbow stars and i just went on a walk around the lake like that on my microdose yeah and the amount of looks i got and smiles that i got was hilarious um but it was just fun to play a character and mm-hmm. just to like see what it felt like to play that character. Like I called it my meme day of playing a meme. Yeah. Um, it was great. Just switch it up, you know, trying something new. Why not? That's awesome. We wear, I ma- love that. we wear masks all the time. Might as well pick the one you're going to wear. You know what yes, I mean? Yes. I love that. Cause like we are at all moments when you are out, 
you are wearing some sort of mask, like whether you realize it or not. So you might as well be conscious of it and pick the one that you're going to wear. And then realize too, that even when you wear all of these masks, even with the people that have known you for 10, 20 years in your life, you can still switch it up at any given moment. Mm -hmm. You don't have to play, keep playing the same character. And so you can just choose to have a different experience. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking back to one of the podcasts that I did with um, uh, Stuart, uh, Alchemy of Prayers is, is, is what he does. But um, he was saying, you know, we, we have all these experiences and I think people get caught up in these experiences and don't realize that they have the ability to change, but you can just switch it up at any point if you really want to. But a lot of people are, are scared to do that because they're scared of the unknown and they're scared of doing something different because, you know, who knows how it's going to turn out. But if it turns out shitty, you can go back to the other character. Yeah. I actually had a client, uh, one, of, one of my more recent clients um, was a couple out in like a small town in Illinois. And the husband had a, he basically, he basically had to face his fear of death like in a pretty big way. And it shook him up to like to the core because he, I, and I asked him when we talked the next day, I said, are you telling me that you think you know what's going to happen a month from now? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, okay, well, that's problem number one, right? Because nobody knows what's going to happen a month from now. Um, but he wasn't a spiritual person. You know, he was a big Sam Harris fan, like all of like atheism was the way for him. And all of a sudden he couldn't, truthfully say that that was what he believed anymore. And he said, well, can I like try on the spirituality thing for a while? And then can I go back if I want to? And I said, yeah, you can't, you can go back. Um, but just keep in mind, you'll be lying to yourself, right? Like mm -hmm. you'll be lying to yourself. So yeah, we can always choose to go back. And at some point I do think we outgrow these. And that's a lot of how, you know, psychedelics help us, right? It's like, they help us see what the patterns we've outgrown. Um, but yeah, try on a new mask. If you don't like it, go back to the old yeah. one. It's all good. Psychedelics like help us see like truth too. And then mm -hmm. once you see that truth, as you said, it's, it's a lot harder to go back because like, you know, you're lying to yourself and then you might, you know, your mind might try to convince you that you're not lying to yourself, but deep down you're, 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 you're lying to yourself and it's, you know, it's, yep. it's going to build up <laughs> over time. Something about the, the fear of death too, is like, I, 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 I just want to ask you this question. Like, do you, do you feel like you've died before? Yes. Yeah, I do too. And it's hard to, it's hard to explain that to somebody that hasn't really experienced that. But like, I, I it, it sort of just gives me solace. Like, I, I'm really not scared of death. I don't think I ever really was scared of death to begin with. I, you know, I don't think I, I, I liked it. And I'm certainly not trying to die anytime soon. But I don't think it's something that I'm scared of. Because like, I guess to me, I, I, I think this little quote that I made up is like, you know, I've, I've, I've already died before. It just hasn't been permanent yet. Mm, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've, yet. I've, 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 I've already <laughs> experienced that just, you know, again, it's, it's just there. So, you know, I, that, that helps me live more fully mm -hmm. is thinking that. I had a really good friend. Um, he was a medicine man and he was a watch and marrow and, um, worked a lot with peyote and he died in October last year. He died very suddenly from a freak accident. And, um, but he was in the hospital for three days on life support and he was able to like, uh, he could, he could hear and respond and talk and stuff for three days, uh, before everything. And, um, it was so, I had such an interesting experience because the weekend, like basically I had a client on Saturday uh, up in Dallas. So I live in Austin. I drove up to Dallas and the whole drive, I kept feeling, I kept having flashes of my own death. I actually thought I, like, it was so present in my awareness that I thought I was going to die. I was having, pre I thought I was having premonitions basically of my own death. And it persisted throughout the whole day. Um, and they were like gruesome images of me getting in car accidents and all this stuff. Right. And so I started to talk to death as an entity. And I said, Hey, death, how you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's your I, girl. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> like, I see you there. I see you in my awareness. I don't know why you're here. Um, 
And just so we're clear, I don't choose you. I'm just going to claim that right now. I do not choose death. I choose life. Like, no offense, death, but I choose life. And um, I don't know why you're here, but you can stay here. And if it is my time to go, just make it quick. And it was so interesting um, because I had to really sit with that. Like, if I am, I mean, I don't think anybody knows when they're going to die, but I certainly felt like I was going to that day. I mean, it was so vivid and intense in my awareness. Um but I really did get to this place where I was like, if it happens, I'm okay with it. I don't choose that. I don't want to, but if it happens, I'm okay with it. Yeah. And I accept that. And it's, it's the most natural thing, birth and death, you know, the most natural things that we'll ever experience. Every human will experience those two things at some point in their life. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> uh, well on that, I'm going to end this and I want to thank you so much for just coming on and, having an amazing conversation about your life and about where you're going and what you're doing. And I'm, I'm so excited for you just to see how love to the people evolves and how you continue to evolve as well. So thank you again. And I love you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Cam. I love you too. And same, same to you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you everybody for listening to this week's episode of the trip sitting podcast. And thank you to Sarah for coming on and being such an amazing guest and an amazing human. Now, if everybody can once again, make sure that you are following trip sitting, make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast and give this a rating. Once again, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. And if you have any ideas for guests that you want to get me in contact with, or if maybe you're even looking to sponsor this episode or sponsor further episodes or any of my content, please reach out to me, tripsittingblog at gmail.com, and we can go ahead and start having a discussion. So thanks again, and we'll see you next episode.